We'll start with the question that everybody probably asks you is how you're doing. You know, I'm, I'm feeling really, really good now. I feel so much stronger. Uh, even when I was discharged, <coughs> if you look at pictures of me coming out of the hospital on my way to rehab, I still had a little pink pail in my lap because sitting up or standing would make me nauseous. And now, just like four weeks later, the lightheadedness and feeling of nauseous is completely gone when I sit up or stand. I could only walk 45 feet at the most, which was I was pleased with. And now I'm walking on at least a mile in the morning and at least a mile in the evening. So I'm going over two miles a day um, and I'm getting stronger, beginning to put back on some of the weight that I lost. And uh, overall, I think my doctors and therapists think I'm ahead of schedule. Uh, and it's, I was the first COVID-19 patient at Rochester General that was in a coma and um, on a ventilator kept alive. And so they didn't have a lot of guidance or a lot of experience with how this is going to go. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a, a lot of people in that situation don't have s successful outcomes, but it's been a, a good trail for me and I think kind of a learning experience for the doctors and surgical teams that, uh, that saved my life. And they've been able to see uh, what works in, in, uh, with me. And uh, so I, I'm really grateful to everybody that worked so hard, just the dozens and dozens of people on a medical team that could uh, help me recover. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I'm feeling really pretty darn good now. And I'm thinking, you know, in a, just a couple of weeks, going back to work part-time. What struck me about your sickness is that you haven't reached retirement age yet. You run 5Ks. You don't fit the stereotype of a severe COVID-19 victim. Yes, that's, uh, that's true. I was in better sh physical fitness than I had been in decades. I had uh, the advice of my doctors who were talking about diabetes, and I had started a pretty strict diet and exercise regimen where I was going to the gym virtually every day. And when this hit, I was very physically fit. Every other day I was running from a 5K to a five mile on the treadmill. And the other days I was doing workouts on uh, weight machines. And I was in very good shape. I think as a result, my heart stayed strong. And I think that was very helpful. The disease attacked mostly my lungs. And, um, and there was some lung damage. But now um, I'm healing pretty well. And so I have um, a CAT scan scheduled for September 1st. They'll see how much I've healed by then. And the likelihood is that I may lose some capacity in my lungs, but the doctors are beginning to think it may not be particularly noticeable by me. And, and we'll see, but I continue to heal. When did this all start and how did it start? Well, I started feeling what, I, I never had uh, a fever. And fever was one of the telltale signs of a, of a coronavirus. Um, and this is in you know, the end of the first week in March. So it was an early on in the uh, outbreak. And so I contacted my doctor who said, you, know, you probably have a different kind of flu variant. Come in and we'll test you. And they tested for flu, which came back negative. And he called to tell me that it came back negative. That night, I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and passed out. So my wife called 911 and I went by ambulance to Rochester General and there they did a COVID-19 test which came back positive. But my symptoms weren't so bad that I was discharged and quarantined in a spare bedroom here at the house. And um, But after three or four days my cough was getting worse and worse and worse. And my wife drove me back to Rochester General I remember driving there with her and getting out and walking into the emergency department and sitting in a wheelchair. And that's the last thing I remember until I woke up three and a half weeks, four weeks later. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately I got through, they needed to sedate me heavily and feed me with a tube down my n nose. And, um, and when you're in that situation, you really need to be sedated. And that was a ventilator kept me alive. Um, but they were uh, able to, Dr. Liang at Rochester General uh, took the risk to herself of operating on an, someone with an active COVID-19 infection, 
and she and a physical uh, a physician's assistant and a respiratory technologist uh, tech uh, went in and performed the operation. And at that point, I began to recover. I, without the tracheotomy being done, I'm not sure that uh, I would have ever been able to wean off of the ventilator and and be removed from the from the paralyzed state that I, I was in. So um, I think some people took some risks on my behalf. The care I got at Rochester General was exceptional. And uh, the end result is that I'm getting better. Was there a point in the transition after you had woken up where you realized what you had had and how close you were? I didn't really realize how close I was to, I mean, I didn't know, for example, that do not resuscitate orders had been signed and the doctors were beginning to have some very serious discussions, my wife. Fortunately, I began to turn the corner right around the same time and showed signs of improvement, and, uh, and I did rally. But I didn't know a lot of that until I was released from the MICU unit at Rochester General to a regular room. And even then, the, the first room I was in right after the MICU, uh, I was having difficulty distinguishing between the delusional thinking and reality. But after about a week uh, and being moved to another room, and working with therapists and so on, um, my thinking cleared right up. And uh, it doesn't seem like I've had any loss of neurological function. Um, I seem to be able to do everything I was before. I've had a number of tests done by neurologists and psychologists, and that's all worked out. And um, I seem to be making a, a good recovery. So, One of the unfortunate parts about this is loved ones can't be in the room, but the medical team, were, they were able to put a phone next to your ear so your family could talk to you even while you're in the coma. And you were telling me that you don't remember anything specifically about what they said, but that one story. Yes, pretty. yes. Uh, I think also what really became critical to my surviving this is that um, I was having a, well, Dr. Adam Herman is the palliative care doctor that worked with me. And um, my, my family, my sister and my wife were very concerned that they weren't able to talk to me or see me because of the visitor restrictions. And uh, so Dr. Herman landed on an idea of taking his personal cell phone in and setting it on the pillow by my head so that they could talk to me. At that time, I was having a very persistent dream that wasn't reality, but I was dreaming that I was trapped in a house, unable to move, and that I was so hot and exhausted and, um, uh, and just tired that I remember saying out in, in my dream to this empty room, I don't know if I can make it you know, through this night. And around that time, I heard uh, voices outside the house saying, yes, he's in there, uh, you know, it's gonna be okay. And in my dream, I felt this huge sense of relief just overwhelm me that allowed me to relax and I slept more restfully and um, so after I was um, taken out of the coma, I asked my wife, I said, was my brother-in-law uh, on the cell phone calls? Because I heard his voice in this dream. They said, oh, yes, he was talking to you like every day. And I, I just think, you know, you never really know, is that a real experience or, or what? But in my mind, I think hearing familiar voices was imp an important turning point for me and it allowed me to begin to feel like I could recover. And, uh, and as a result, Adam, um, my wife and I started a, a fund called the Ted and Sue O'Brien Family Patient Connection Fund. And what that is um, done, we've raised over $40,000 at this point, and it allows the palliative care team to, they're collaborating with RIT on a project uh, or contemplating, and find ways to increase the ability to communicate between doctors, patients, and family members. Uh, so if you're out of town or you, if there's visitor restrictions or those kinds of things, regardless of the disease, um, that you can have a connection with your family. Because we believe that that was really important to me and we believe it'll be important to other families as well. One of my last questions for you, there's a debate right now of testing and masking and all that stuff. Having gone through this experience, do you have any opinion 
when it comes to this particular issue that's making its way through the country? I absolutely do have uh, strong feelings about the importance of wearing masks and of social distancing. Uh, it's just incredibly important. And I know it's not convenient, uh, but compared to the path that I went down, the inconvenience of masking and social distancing compared to uh, exposing someone, a loved one, to uh, a disease that could be very, very significant. Uh, you know, people still are dying from it. People are, like me, I have a long road to recovery. And uh, matched against the inconvenience of wearing a mask, it's, it just doesn't measure up. And it's just so important to follow this advice from the medical community. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's maybe become a little bit of a partisan issue. It shouldn't be. It's just take these small steps to make sure that those around you remain safe. Any other thoughts on this journey that you had no idea you'd go on at the beginning of March? Well, it, it is amazing to me. Um, I thought, you know, you'd ask me about my fitness and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm 63, which is starting to get into the range when COVID-19 uh, hits people hard. But I thought, you know, if, if I did get, get the virus, that it wouldn't be too bad for me personally. But you just never know. I mean, it can hit young people, old people. It uh, affects older people, I think, um, percentage-wise more harshly than young people. But anybody can get it. And taking these reasonable steps to avoid uh, this health problem is, um, is the best advice I could give to anybody. I did have the opportunity to go with one of my doctors just yesterday to visit both people at the MICU that I hadn't ever interacted with consciously before, uh, who were so gratified to see me. And, you know, it's important for people working in that setting who don't always have successful outcomes for people that they're working so hard to help recover. And then they see me walk into my own power and, uh, and doing much, much better. Um, I think it was a sort of a celebratory meeting for them as well as for me. I was so excited to see them.